Welcome back, my friends, to episode 3 of the Star Sector Campaign Walkthrough Series. Hope you're all ready to turn up the heat as I know I left last episode on a cliffhanger. So let's start chapter 11, picking your battles. You're going to see exactly why I'm calling it that in just a moment. I'll slow it down and explain. We know there are two pirate fleets guarding the jump point. As we burn towards the jump point, we'll see both of the fleets pop up in sensor range. Since we're moving with our transponder on, the enemy fleets are already on an intercept course with us. We'll need to take a hard turn away to avoid head-on contact. If we moved our fleet into them just now, the pirate fleets would reinforce each other. We'd have to take on both fleets at once, which we want to avoid. Once we have decent distance between our fleet and theirs, we'll use the Go Dark ability to drastically reduce our sensor profile and take a hard turn. Our objective is to avoid the sensor range of one of the fleets while maintaining contact with the other. The fleet in the upper left is now returning to the jump point, assuming we ran off, while the closer fleet is staying in the area. Now that the fleets are separated, we'll make our move. We'll disable Go Dark and catch the second fleet before it can retreat. Perfect. We've made contact with the pirate fleet and they won't have reinforcements. Let's analyze the enemy fleet. They do have a Venture class cruiser which we'll need to watch out for, but the other three ships are easy targets. If we choose our targets carefully, we should be able to take out this fleet with little trouble. We'll be deploying all six of our combat capable ships for this engagement. Our fleet is composed of our Hammerhead destroyer along with five frigates. We'll make sure our Hammerhead is escorted by our lasher and a kite to cover its flanks. Wolf frigates can handle themselves and the other kite has our officer piloting it, so he'll be all right. Once we get into visual range, we'll pick our first target. Remember the buffalo from episode one we didn't salvage? This enemy fleet has one. It lacks shields and any significant weaponry, making it an extremely vulnerable target. We'll phase right up to its face and start shooting. By doing this, we're also drawing its front away from our allies, leaving it exposed to the Salamander and Harpoon missiles. Ah yes, the giant, eye-burning, white explosion flash. Now there is something I don't miss about vanilla. The engagement is now 3v6. The enemy may have a cruiser, but we have twice their numbers. To capitalize on our advantage, we're going to flank the cruiser so it can't effectively shield against all targets. The Venture Cruiser has strong forward firepower, but is vulnerable if we can get behind it. Therefore, we'll stick to its side and back where we can hit its engines. The Wolf Frigate is very mobile, so you'll see me jumping in and out of combat so I can vent the extra flux. Surprisingly, the enemy Hound managed to beat our Lasher in a 1v1 duel. With the destruction of the Venture Cruiser, the enemy fleet has been defeated, so we'll chase down the Hound before it can escape. For chasing targets, we'll keep our shield down, so we can take advantage of the Zero Flux boost. Once we manage to close the distance, a few ion cannon shots is enough to disable the engines of the Hound. We've taken out the first pirate fleet, but we certainly weren't perfect. In the ship recovery screen, if the text is highlighted in yellow, it means you have some of your own ships to recover. Unfortunately, our lasher was destroyed and the hull was broken in the previous engagement. It'd take a miracle to bring her back, and we don't feel like spending a story point for another miracle. So instead, we'll recover the other two ships from the enemy fleet, the Buffalo and the Hound. Recovering both of these ships will put us over our crew required as indicated by the red portion on the blue bar. 
So what actually happens when we go over our crew required? It means we've pushed past our skeleton crew limit, and there are essential positions not being filled on our ships. In game terms, this will lower the combat readiness of every ship in our fleet, as our crew are spread too thinly. You will want to avoid this situation wherever possible. To solve this issue, we could temporarily mothball some of our ships, which is what we'd do if we were in deep space, but since we're in system, we'll head back to Enkaira and hire some additional crew. We're opening up new job positions like crazy, aren't we? While we're back, we can sell any extra scrap or loot for extra cash. Now let's go finish off that second pirate fleet. Something we forgot to do is refit our newly acquired ships. That was silly of us, but no matter. Our other combat vessels should be able to handle this pirate fleet. They only have three ships. The enemy fleet does have an Enforcer Destroyer, which is the main ship we'll want to watch out for, as it rivals our Hammerhead in firepower. So for this second battle, we'll be deploying our five combat-capable ships, since our Lasher is no longer with us. To keep both our kites and hammerheads safe, we'll tell our ducklings to stay close to Mama Duck. Once again, the wolf frigates can easily pick their battles, so we don't need to worry about them. Much like the first engagement, we're going to pick off the easy targets quickly, before trying to tackle the Enforcer. The Hound frigate makes an easy target as it lacks shields. The Shepherd drone tender will try its best to protect the Hound, but its damage is largely ignorable. If at any point your flux level gets too high like mine is right now, it can be a good idea to back off and vent before pushing the enemy. If your enemy fails to vent in the same way, you'll be at a significant flux advantage, leaving them vulnerable to attack. The Shepherd, now realizing its mistake, tries a desperate spin to win tactic. Bold strategy, Cotton, let's see if it pays off. Wow, we've been picking off the smaller targets, our other frigate has been leading the Enforcer on a fruitless wolf hunt. This has left the Enforcer's back turned to us, making it easy prey. While we lack the firepower to deal any significant damage by ourselves, we'll prevent the Enforcer from cleanly engaging any of our vessels, drastically reducing its damage potential. When flanking a larger vessel with multiple ships like we are doing right now, Try to catch yourself if you are getting in the way of a friendly ship. They are smart enough not to shoot you in the back if you get into their line of fire, but for safety reasons, it's best to avoid such a scenario. When pressing the assault, you can deal more damage if you lower your own shield, so your ships can dedicate all flux to weapons. This is a bit of a gamble as the enemy might be able to sneak a counter shot at your ship. If things get too hot, retreat your ship briefly to vent while letting the rest of your fleet maintain pressure. After finally breaking through the Enforcer's tough armor, we can loot the pirate fleet. We'll recover the Hound as even without shields, we'll find a use for the ship. With the pirate fleets cleared, we can now stabilize the jump point, and put Enkaira back on the galactic map. With the jump point stable, we can now leave the system. But before we do that though, let's get back to Enkaira and talk to Decker and receive our reward. For doing such a great job, We've been given 10,000 credits and will also be receiving a monthly stipend from the Galadia Academy, which will run for three cycles, the equivalent of years in the sector. The monthly stipend will put credits into our account every month, which will greatly help us starting out in the sector. Our next task will be to head to Jangala in the Corvus system and see the station commander there. To travel between systems, we'll be using hyperspace, and in hyperspace, we consume fuel. Decker informs us that we'll need at least 80 units to get there, so we'll make sure we're well supplied beforehand. There's also the possibility of running out of fuel, so we've been given the distress call ability. Fun fact, through my early playtesting of the game, I was one of the key players who got the distress call implemented. Back when the sector had only core worlds, I managed to run out of fuel in the one system without any kind of station, Penelope's Star. Without the distress call or any kind of station to buy more fuel, my fleet was forever locked in the system, doomed to run out of supplies and crumble. I had money in a large fleet, but there was no way out. I brought my problem to the forums. Alex, the 
lead designer of the game, quickly implemented the distress call in the next major update. I lost my whole fleet, so you don't have to. But seriously, don't run out of fuel. We've got three more ships to refit before we leave this system, and being straightforward, they're all low-tech junkers. A buffalo and two hounds. How low-tech are we talking? We're talking no shields and a pile of demods. So what are we going to do? We're going to make these the best possible ships we can, given the weapons and whole mods we have available. For the buffalo, we're going to set it up as a missile support ship, with the idea that it will hang out in the back line and fire missiles to support the frontline ships. A more advanced tip is that if a ship is only equipped with point defense and missiles, it won't attempt to engage in direct combat, which is exactly what we want from our buffalo, as this ship is guaranteed to lose any direct encounter. For hull mods, we're going to make this ship as durable as possible. We'll take hardened subsystems, militarized subsystems, reinforced bulkheads, and blast doors. For weapons, we'll give it Pilum long-range missiles, two racks of harpoons, and some Sayboats. With its assortment of missiles and our selected hull mods, we've got a functioning missile support destroyer that can take a few hits. Now for our two hounds. These are simple, unshielded combat freighters. The biggest advantage these ships have going for them are their medium ballistic mount, small profile, and speed. Let's strip this ship down and give it a custom loadout. An auto cannon for its medium mount, that'll do. And the small ballistic slot, some point defense. Since this is an unshielded ship, we want the best point defense we have so it'll be protected from missiles. We'll rip every last capacitor and vent out, as we'll want those for extra hull mods. Now we can make things happen. Harden subsystems to keep the ship in combat longer. An unstable injector will give it the speed it needs to dodge missiles as well as flank enemy ships. Then blast doors, armored weapon mounts, and reinforced bulkheads to beef up the hull and armor as much as we can, since these hounds will be taking direct fire. Any leftover points can be thrown into vents to keep the weapons cool. To make the refitting process easier, we can save a custom loadout. To save a custom loadout, make sure you give the loadout a name. For demonstration, purposes, we'll call this hound modded. We then save the modded loadout to one of the empty loadout slots. When we select the next hound, we can auto-fit the hound with our custom modded loadout. As we can see, this will instantly apply all the same hull mods to the ship, with the only difference being a thumper as the main gun, since we're all out of auto cannons, which is just fine for now. Auto-fitting, my friend. It'll save you a lot of time. We have to do our obligatory ship organization. The buffalo doesn't deserve to be called a destroyer, so we'll put it behind our wolves, with the hounds securing a spot behind our kites. And there it is, our wonderful fleet ready for the big sector. It's not much to look at, but it's ours. It's time to put our one-size-fits-most star sector pants on and leave Enkaira behind. Now that we've reconnected the system's jump points, job postings will start popping up on the left side of the screen. We're broke and in need of work, so we'll need to keep an eye on what pops up here. To look at the sector map and view important information, we need to bring up the Intel screen, which by default is bound to the E key. We can then sort through all the important information information by using the tabs at the bottom of the window. If there is a mission you are interested in, you can mark it as important by clicking the exclamation icon. So we've got a couple missions that look appealing to us, and we'll take a closer look at those in just a moment. But first, let's get to Jingala. To do our mission, we can click on the important tab at the bottom of the screen. The mission icon will then be next to the system that the mission is in, in this case, the Corvus system. Then, much like we navigate in the local system, we can right click on the Corvus system to plot a course there. Certain mission types require you to manually accept them like exploration missions, so I recommend pausing the game as soon as you see them pop up to check them out. If we click on the shortcut to this mission, we'll be taken to the intel screen and can see where the mission is located. This exploration mission isn't too far away, so we'll accept it for now. If you ever miss clicking on the shortcut that pops up on the left side of the screen, fresh missions can be found in the new tab on the intel screen. We'll try not to get distracted now and get ourselves to Jengala. This might be a rare case, but it seems that some additional pirate forces are guarding the jump point. Our fleet is significantly bigger now, and these are just a handful of frigates, so we'll wipe them out no problem. Hyperspace is a dangerous place, as nobody is in control of it. Watch your sensors like a hawk, and be very aware of your surroundings. Since we burn fuel for every movement while traveling in hyperspace, we need to be efficient, so we'll take the most direct path to Jingala we can, 
only pausing to check missions that pop up. There are often multiple jump points in and out of systems. When entering Corvus, we'll take the jump point that is closest to Jengala, which we can tell by scrolling over the jump point and seeing what planetary bodies are nearby. If you have been traveling with your transponder off, which you should be in hyperspace, you'll get a prompt to turn it back on when entering a lawful system. Since Corvus is a hegemony controlled system, we'll want it back on. If you have your transponder on, you can join into ongoing combat with a friendly fleet. We tried to do so here, but the battle was over just before we arrived. So we'll continue to Jengala. Big, beautiful Jengala. Let's go see what the station commander has for us. Admiral Agrignon, in fact, does not have anything for us, besides several paragraphs worth of advice. This is the end of the official Star Sector tutorial, but certainly not the end of this series. At this point in the game, you are free to roam around the sector and do whatever you feel like. There are story missions to do, money to be made, planets to colonize, and secrets to discover. The game has merely just begun. Angrignan informs us on a number of things we can do to make money, including becoming commissioned by the Hegemony. You can become commissioned by any of the major factions within the sector, and is as close as you can get to becoming officially employed by said faction. Their enemies become your enemies, and you become an official representative of that faction. You may only be commissioned by one faction at a time. So what are the benefits of commissions? You'll get paid a monthly stipend from that faction, get paid for combating their enemies, as well as raise relations significantly for supporting them. Pretty lucrative as long as you pledge your allegiance to the faction, which in the hegemony's case means laying down the law with an iron fist. And since we're kind of a big deal, we're going to sign up for a hegemony commission. This will provide us with a monthly stipend of 30,000 credits, which will scale as our player level increases, as well as additional bounty funds for destroyed ships hostile with the hegemony. It will also immediately make us hostile with pirates, Tritachyon, Persian League, as well as the Ludic Path. Plenty of things for us to shoot at, sign me up. As we raise our relations with the hegemony, we'll also be given access to their higher-end military equipment. This will take time, but it's something we can look forward to. What if we wanted to resign our commission at some point? We have the right to do so, but it certainly comes with consequences. The hegemony will no longer trust us and will of course stop providing us with credits monthly. Commissions are a big deal, don't sign one unless you are serious. We picked up a Cerberus Frigate, which is another low-tech salvage. The Cerberus Frigate is actually one of my vanilla favorites as it's a useful early game frigate for a number of reasons. It functions much like an upsized hound, with a medium ballistic slot and also lacking shields. While it might not be the most useful frigate for combat, its large shielded cargo holds can help with looting and smuggling. With a small overhead cost, the Cerberus certainly has a place in our fleet. For refitting, we'll give it a similar treatment to the Hound and equip it with hardened subsystems, armored weapon mounts, blast doors, auxiliary boosters, and reinforced bulkheads. Since there are no shields, we only require minimal capacitors and vents. It's time for our first mission outside of the core worlds. It might seem a little scary, but all you need to do is plan your trip and pack enough supplies and fuel. Our first mission will be hunting down this 48,000 credit bounty, Space Cowboy style. To easily determine if we can make the trip, we can press the Show Fuel Range button at the top left of the sector map, or W which is the designated hotkey. We now have these massive orange circles on our map. The bright orange circle shows the distance we can travel and still make it back to our current location before running out of fuel. We can travel anywhere in the lighter orange, but it'll be a one-way ticket unless we pick up more fuel somewhere along the way. Luckily for us, the bounty we're pursuing is just inside the bright orange circle, so we should not have to worry about running out and can plot a course straight to the bounty location. Once we've left Jengala, we find some scattered debris and disabled ships from the previous combat. You won't get in trouble with the authorities for legitimate salvage, so feel free to help yourself to some leftovers. This particular situation was a bit odd, but there can sometimes be hostile fleets lurking in hyperspace. Whenever you are around jump points, be ready to emergency burn and pause the game if necessary. There are enough fleets nearby that the pirate fleet isn't an issue, and we can get out of here quickly. When traveling in hyperspace, keep your transponder off and maintain sustained burn. Once we get away from the core worlds, we'll see very few fleets, so we'll be able to relax a bit and focus on navigation. And speaking of navigation, we'll want to follow the arrows that are pointing us towards our destination. There are many nebula which function like space clouds. You'll travel slower through them, but you'll also be 
harder to detect, so it's possible to use them to avoid hostile fleets. As you might guess, you'll also want to avoid stormy bits. We'll talk more about advanced hyperspace navigation in the next episode. Looks like our monthly credit statement came in. Let's click on the notification to see the details. For the previous month, we had a net income of 18,000 credits. Not bad for just starting out. The flat 15k from the Gladi Academy as well as our hegemony commission, which is scaled based on our player level. For expenses, we need to pay our crew and officers. We don't have any colonies yet, so that area is neutral. If you ever want to navigate to your income tab at any time, you can press the D hotkey for command, then 3 for the income tab as you can see at the top of the screen. We're on our way to our first mission in the outer sector, and it's a great time to wrap up this episode. You know what good people do? They push those buttons. All of them. Push them, do it! You're a good person, right? These videos do take a long time to make, so please consider supporting the channel and telling your mom and dad of how great of a person I am. This has been episode 3 of the Star Sector Ultimate Campaign Walkthrough Series. Alright friends, I'm Ironclad Line, and I'll see you in the next episode. Oh, yeah!